We live in a world where globalization and trade have become one of the most vital aspects in determining the power of a country's economy. In fact, the process of getting goods from point A to point B might be one of the most important economic drivers in the world, yet no one really talks about it. And somehow, quietly in the background, we might be seeing the creation of the most powerful trading economy in the world but not for the reasons that you might think. If you want to get an item from a manufacturing hub like China to a consumer hub in a place like New York, how would you do it? Well, you could just send the package on a direct flight and it'll get there in roughly 15 hours. But this is extremely costly because it actually costs anywhere between five and 15 times more to ship by air than to ship by the most common shipping method by sea. So we are probably going to need to use a sea freighter. So now that you know this, how would you deliver the package? Well, you could drop the package off at Long Beach, California and use a rail or a truck to move the item to New York. But again, that is usually more costly. So now we are in a predicament. In order to get an item from China all the way to New York, a ship would need to cross the Pacific Ocean, travel all the way around the bottom of South America, then make its way through the Atlantic Ocean before reaching its destination after traveling more than 30,000 kilometers. And this was a problem that was faced for hundreds of years. For example, when countries like Great Britain wanted to trade with the west coast of the United States or South America, virtually all ships would have needed to travel around the bottom of South America in order to deliver their goods. That was until the early 1900s when the United States decided to buy up an 82 kilometer long plot of land in Panama. You see, the United States saw that this was the smallest amount of land that separated the Atlantic Ocean from the Pacific Ocean. So they thought that this land could be used for both trade and military purposes. They ended up purchasing this plot of land for roughly $40 million in the early 1900s, which is roughly $916 million today. And after the purchase, they then created an artificial lake and dug trenches from this new artificial lake to both the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. And finally, on August 15th, 1914, the Panama Canal was opened. And this was a monumental moment in history as it was the first time that an American ship could travel directly between the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean without going around South America. The first ship to pass through the Panama Canal was a cargo ship called the SS Ancon, and it was largely responsible for shipping cement from New York to Panama in order to help build the canal's infrastructure. And this opening of the Panama Canal would go on to change the world in many ways. For example, in 2019, nearly 1 million ships passed through this canal, which indirectly resulted in trillions of dollars worth of commerce. The canal also generated roughly 2.6 billion dollars worth of fees for granting access for the use of the canal. So the canal itself is actually a pretty decent money maker as well. But this canal also has limits. For example, no ships longer than 1200 feet or wider than 168 feet can actually pass through the Panama Canal as the waterway is simply not large enough to allow bigger ships through. So that is why today you see most cargo ships being built with the exact dimensions needed to fit the Panama Canal. Another unforeseen effect that this canal had was that it wreaked havoc on some South American countries like Chile. This was because the ships that once had to stop at multiple port cities along the Chilean coast all of a sudden just stopped coming by. This was a large contributing factor to an economic collapse in Chile, which saw its state income and international trade cut in half within nearly two years. But arguably the biggest effect that this canal had was that the United States now gained total control over all trade between the two oceans. Because the Panama Canal created much more efficient trade routes that would cut thousands or even tens of thousands of kilometers off of most shipping routes, it made the Panama Canal the most vital part of trade in the Western world. And because the United States controlled it, they had ultimate power over trade. So for example, if 
China wanted to trade with Brazil in the 1990s, the United States got to decide whether or not that trade could happen. And if they did decide to let that trade happen, they got to take a large fee of tens of thousands of dollars for just letting one single cargo ship pass through the canal. So this canal for nearly 100 years was one of the most important parts of the world's globalization and trade. And in 1999, the United States officially handed over control of the canal to Panama, conditional upon Panama maintaining neutrality of the canal and not rejecting or subsidizing or giving any sort of preferential treatment to any country. But that leads us to the question, what if there was another nation that owned a much better passage between the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean? And what if this nation does not maintain neutrality of trade like Panama has over the past 21 years? Well, today we might be seeing the creation of the most influential trade route in history, and it is owned by one single country. You see, European nations between the 16th century and 19th century were constantly looking for more efficient trade routes to reach the west coast of North America. So instead of traveling south and having to go around South America, they thought that there must be some passage to the northwest that would allow them to cross the Atlantic Ocean into the Pacific. The trouble was that during all of the European expeditions to the northwest, they were all abruptly stopped because all the waterways were blocked by endless amounts of ice. But then around the year 1800, as the Industrial Revolution was underway, the Earth began to warm up. From the year 1806 up until the year 1906, the average temperature on Earth increased by about 0.7 degrees Celsius. And for many parts of Canada, the average temperature increased by over 1.3 degrees Celsius. And even though this may not seem like much, that temperature increase was just enough to melt a little bit of ice in Canada's northern territories of Nunavut, Northwest Territories, and the Yukon. That was when Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen and his six crew members attempted to travel in a small fishing vessel all the way from Norway to the Yukon. And even though their journey took three years and their ship traveled through some extremely shallow waters, they eventually completed their journey and thereby became the first ship to pass through the newly formed Northwest Passage. And this was the first time in history that a ship passed from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean without going around South America. And even though at the time the Northwest Passage was still too icy in 1906, in order for it to be a viable route by the vast majority of shipping vessels, things would dramatically change over the next century. You see, as the human population continued to grow by billions and energy consumption kept growing exponentially, so did the effects of climate change. And from the year 1906 to the year 1944, the average temperature in Canada increased by another half degree Celsius. This led to more ice melting in the Canadian territories and allowed for the first single season trip through the Northwest Passage by Henry Larson and his crew. And in 1969, as more ice continued to melt, the first cargo ship was able to traverse traverse the Northwest Passage with the assistance of some icebreakers. And by 2008, after nearly another 0.7 degree increase in the Earth's temperature, the Northwest Passage was clear for many commercial ships to travel through without the need of an icebreaker or Coast Guard assistance. And by the 2010s, there was so little ice in the Northwest Passage that the trip was completed fairly regularly by vessels ranging from medium-sized cruise ships to bare grills traversing the water waters on an inflatable boat. And this all culminated in September of 2013, when the MS Nordic Orion became the first bulk carrier ship to cross the Northwest Passage. This ship was carrying over 73,500 short tons of coal from Vancouver all the way to Finland. And what made this trip so important was that the Nordic ship was too big and carrying too much cargo to pass through the Panama Canal. It was also able to cut nearly 2,000 kilometers off of its travel distance, which saved the vessel nearly $80,000 in fuel and over $100,000 in Panama Canal fees. And lastly, because the Northwest Passage was a much more efficient shipping route, it ended up being a much more environmentally friendly route as well, which is slightly ironic that climate change ended up creating a more climate friendly transportation route, but I digress. In 2019 alone, about 40 cargo ships, cruise ships, research vessels, and bulk carriers made their way through this passage. 
And some of these ships were traveling between Europe and China, which ended up saving them two weeks of travel time and cut down their fuel consumption by up to 40%. And as the passage becomes more accessible and as more ice melts every single year, we will likely see an increase in the usage of this Northwest Passage. In fact, a study by Smith and Stevenson in 2013 estimated that the Northwest Passage will become substantially more accessible by around 2040 to 2060. And at this point, it would cut the transit distance of most ships that use the Panama Canal by several thousand kilometers. It would also allow for much larger ships to deliver their goods, which would make shipping even more efficient as well. This theoretically would make the Northwest Passage the new shipping hub of the world, as most countries would look to cut costs by using this shipping route versus using the Panama Canal. This would mean that Canada could potentially dictate which countries could use the passage, what fees they may charge, and could preferentially choose which countries will be winners and losers in the global shipping market. And if you think that Canada would never induce tariffs or treat countries differently on trade, then you are wrong. For example, on June 29, 2018, Canada imposed 25% tariffs on steel and aluminum from the United States. Also right now, they are currently evaluating whether to hit Saudi Arabia and Russia with oil tariffs. And lastly, Canada has constantly voted in the United Nations to impose economic sanctions on countries that have committed human rights violations and those that simply have major disagreements with Canada. So Canada has shown that in certain scenarios, it is more than willing to pick and and choose which countries should get hit in terms of trade relations. This could mean that countries that go against Canada's views in the future could potentially be hit with sanctions that would make them uncompetitive in the global trade market. And if that wasn't a big enough power grab for Canada, there is another aspect of the Northwest Passage that might make Canada one of the most powerful economic forces in the world, and that is oil. You see, Canada is already the seventh largest oil producer in the world, but it is estimated that 30% of the world's oil is located in the untapped Arctic. So as the ice continues to melt every single year and oil extraction becomes more practical in territories like Nunavut, we could potentially see Canada join the big three oil producers in the United States, Saudi Arabia, and Russia, where Canada could become the biggest player in the oil market. And not only because they would be producing more oil, Oil, but because they could also dictate which oil tankers get to use the Northwest Passage. Now, even though this new shipping route seems to be the future of shipping, there are definitely some major drawbacks. The first of which is that Canada has not developed the infrastructure needed to attract an influx of cargo ships. For example, Canada right now has only six ports in all of its northern territories, and none of which are deemed suitable for a lot of extremely large ships. Meanwhile, a country like Panama that has 98% less of a surface area than Canada's territories has 13 ports and five of which are deemed suitable for large ships. Another drawback of the Northwest Passage is that there are other competitive routes like the Northeast Passage that is owned by Russia. And even though Russia has developed its passage at a much higher level than Canada has, there are two reasons why Russia's passage may not be as impactful as Canada's. The first of which is that many Western nations around the world have much better political ties with Canada and would prefer to use a country who they view as an ally. The second of which is that Russia's passage is only a better route to take for some European countries countries that want to trade with some Northeastern Asian countries. Meanwhile, Canada's passage is by far the best connection between wealthier countries, such as the UK, the United States, and China. But potentially the biggest roadblock towards Canada having the ultimate control over the world's trade is an ownership dispute. You see, even though Canada views its Northwest Passage as internal waterways, many other nations want the Northwest Passage to be considered an international waterway, which would be free to use by all countries around the world. And there are a few good cases of international waterways around the world, such as the Dan Bay River that gives ocean access to Austria, Hungary, Moldova, and Serbia. The Danish Straits give ocean access to the Scandinavian countries, and the Turkish Straits give the Black Sea countries ocean access. So if the Northwest Passage were to eventually be considered an international waterway, Canada would have no control over who gets to use this passage. And this political dispute over the Northwest Passage came to a head in 1980. 
1985 when the United States sent an icebreaker to the Northwest Passage without permission from the Canadian government. This was because the United States viewed the Northwest Passage as an international waterway and didn't think that sending an icebreaker in between some of Canada's islands was against international law. This sparked outrage across Canada, which eventually led to a signed agreement between the United States and Canada in 1988, where the United States agreed to ask permission for future use of this Northwest Passage. But all in all, this new shipping route is still in its infancy as it only has a few dozen large commercial ships use the passage each year. That's a long ways away from its main competitor in the Panama Canal, who takes on nearly 1 million ships every single year. But as investment and usage of the Canadian Arctic continues to grow every single year, Canada might soon be able to put enough money towards the Northwest Passage in order to make it the number one shipping route in the world. And if that were to happen, we could see Canada become arguably the most powerful nation on the planet in regards to global trade. So what do you think of the Northwest Passage? Do you think it is the future of shipping? And do you consider it to be Canada's internal waters or an international waterway? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you liked this video, please leave a like, that helps me out a lot, and hit that subscribe button if you want to see more of my upcoming videos. Also, make sure to click on my documentaries playlist as I have a bunch of videos just like this in that playlist. So make sure to click on that right now, and I will see you guys in just a few seconds.